Welcome to Varm Blog in conjunction with Strange Matters Magazine, and I guess today also with uh, the Real News Network. Um, so I'm here at Maximilian Alvarez, and we're talking about his book, which in the tradition of Sterod's Tarkle is kind of working class interviews, but a very specific variety, and that is during the period of the high point of COVID. And I feel like your book is actually a necessary intervention in the way that we have used, quote, the working class, unquote, as a kind of cipher for all sorts of politics to kick around. And from the selections of it I've read, it, your profile is cut in a lot of different directions. So what are some things that that you noticed that emerged from these interviews that you did? Yeah, well, uh, first things first, great to uh, be here with you, man. Thank you so much for having me on. And uh, let me publicly apologize for being such a hard person to pin down. Uh, I know I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and it's just been nuts the past few months. So appreciate that we finally get the chance to do this. And uh, yeah, really appreciate the great work that you're doing on this channel. And of course, want to give a huge shout out uh, to the great Francis Madison, uh, who wrote um, a review of my book and published uh, it in the magazine Strange Matters. Um, really, really can't say enough about how incredible of a person, uh, how beautiful of a writer and how beautiful of a soul Francis is. Um, and I was truly honored for her to review this book and to see that review published in Strange Matters. So thank you to everyone there. Uh, please go support them. Um, support Varn Vlog. Uh, you know, we, we, we need these channels. And, um, you know, where else, like, who else is like kind of having me on to talk about, you know, this, this work, right? I mean, I think that that speaks for itself. So I just wanted to kind of say that up top. Um, but yeah, as you, as you mentioned, um, the, the book is called The uh, the Work of Living, Working People Talk About Their Lives in the Year the World Broke. And um, yeah, to kind of make your, your point, the, the subtitle is actually an ode to Studs Terkel because he has a similar subtitle in his famous book, Working, uh, where he interviewed regular working people about their lives and about their jobs. And I even read a passage from Studs Terkel's working, uh, his introduction to that, in the very first episode of my podcast, Working People, that I ever recorded, which was a two and a half hour conversation with my dad, Jesus Alvarez. Um, but Studs, yeah, like I, I, Studs, you know, runs through my veins. And I think uh, a lot of us wouldn't be doing what we're doing if Studs, you know, hadn't done what he did over the course of his incredible career and i think one of the beautiful things about studs turkle's legacy is that there is no one inheritor to it right i mean mm -hmm. i am in league with folks like yourself um great uh journalists uh who covered the labor beat like uh, kim kelly luis felice leon sarah jaffe michelle chen even stephen greenhouse the valley labor report Jonah Furman, In These Times, right? Labor Notes. Like, there's a lot of folks out there doing important work, and I'm very honored to be uh, in that struggle with them and with you. And so, anyway, enough, enough preamble. Like, the, the, the reason that I put this book together um, at, you know, the end of year one of COVID, right? So, so this was a book of interviews with 10 different workers that I conducted in around December of 2020 and January and February of 2021. So that was really before we had vaccines. Uh, that was after an incredibly tumultuous year where life itself had seemingly been turned upside down. And I think we saw the best and the worst of each other. Um, and we also saw the best and worst of the people and institutions that govern our world. And I, I just knew in the early days of COVID, right, I, I put out this call, uh, I think it was after the first month of COVID, and I was like, my head was spinning just like everybody else's. And I, I wanted to know what people were going through. And so I put out a call on social media for folks to send in testimonies um, uh, about 
what they were what they were doing for work or if they were out of work, uh, what COVID the, the COVID reality looked like wherever they happened to be. And I was really overwhelmed by the the response that I got. I got ended up publishing almost six hours worth of testimonies on my podcast, Working People, uh, in a two part compilation episode back in the spring, early summer of 2020. Um, and it was after that that Or Books uh, approached me uh, about possibly doing a book in that vein, um, doing the kinds of interviews that. I've been known to do on my show Working People and now at the Real News Network for my segment at Breaking Points, yada, yada, yada. And to be honest with you, man, like, I didn't know if I really wanted to do a book at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. I, was, I was actually quite hesitant about it um, because I'm very partial to the medium of audio. Um, I feel like, you know, ever since that first conversation I recorded with my dad, I just realized that there is something special to that medium, to this medium. Right. Some a type of intimacy that you can get when, you know, you're just dialed in and it's just you and the voice in your ear and vice versa. Right. And I feel like that type of those types of conversations that I've had for the podcast have allowed me to open up a lot more of myself when I'm in conversation with with other working people um, over the past five seasons that We've been producing the show. <clears throat> um, and I didn't know if that would translate the text all that well, right? I mean, I feel like you, you you also, there's a lot of affective stuff that goes on when, you know, you have your headphones on or you're folding laundry and your phone's playing the podcast. You really do kind of get entranced in the other person's voice and their story. And it focuses you in a way that other mediums don't. And so I didn't know if I, if, if I wanted to produce a book um, but I knew that if I did, I would want it to, as best as possible, kind of capture that type of intimacy, capture that type of attention to detail um, in, you know, the ways that I focus on the people that I'm talking to, right? I, I told Or Books at that point when they approached me about the book, I said, I don't want these interviews to just be about COVID. I want, I want the people that I'm talking to to be the focus of the book. COVID will be there, obviously, but none of that is going to really hit or it's going to mean what I want it to mean or you're not going to understand the human stakes of everything that we're talking about if you don't really truly get to know these people as best you can in the kind of time allotted um, for the one, one and a half hours that I was able to record these interviews. And so that was all kind of the thinking going into it. Um, and once I got, you know, and, and also like it's more complicated doing a book actually than doing a podcast, right? Because as, as you know, it's like if you don't get everything you want in one episode, you could always do another episode, right? And you can always just keep adding installments, right? You can always keep talking to more people and then you can kind of take the, the podcast archive as a whole. Uh, you don't get to do that with a book, right? It's a very finite thing and the thought of only having 10 workers to talk to was exceedingly daunting to me and in the in the first draft of the introduction that I wrote for the book um, I spent you know over half of that intro apologizing for all the people who weren't in the book um, because it just weighed very heavily on me I didn't want people to think that I was trying to present some sort of demographically representative picture of America in this year of COVID. I, I, I didn't want people to see the other folks in this book that way. I didn't want people to look at them as metaphors for the working class, as you said. I wanted people to appreciate the humanity, the individuality, the singularity of every person's life and story. But through that, as always, you know, there are things that we can sympathize with. There are experiences that resonate with us. There are influences that we share in common, right? And that's the real, I think, kind of tender human stuff that connects us across vast differences in generation, in age, in ethnicity, gender, so on and so forth, and the type of work that we do. And so I think like, to answer your question, this is a very long roundabout way of answering your question, like that was what I think stood out to me across all these different interviews, uh, as it always stands out to me doing this podcast is just, I never am, 
I'm always uh, astounded by just how rich everyone's personal story is and how complex people's interior lives are, how full of drama and love and loss and searches for belonging and purpose that all of our life stories are drenched with. And yet we so seldom give one another the gift of listening to those stories. And when you live in a capitalist society that treats working people as grist for the proverbial mill, that, that needs to force us to believe that we are as worthless as this economic system uh, treats us as, right? When you're paid as low as we are, when you're treated as crappily as we are, when you have a, you know, market that sees you as just a, you know, idle consumer, when you have state uh, apparatuses that, um, you know, are, are increasingly unkind the farther we move away from any semblance of a social safety net, let alone a social welfare state, you know, like if you live in this kind of society long enough, you start to believe that, yeah, you are as puny and worthless and um, as your boss tells you that you are, as your landlord tells you that you are, as politicians uh, tell you that you are by the way that they treat you in the form of legislation, the way they talk about you and where you come from. Right. And so I think my work is really I'm dedicated to trying to remind working people that that's not true, that, that we are valuable, that we, that our stories do matter and do deserve to be told and preserved as part of the historical record. And I think that you see that in every one of the conversations that uh, I had for this book. I mean, I, I, I really, it's hard to pick out any one because everyone offers such a different, unique story from Nick Galupo, the grave digger in North Central New Jersey to Ashley Bishop, uh, a bartender in Portland, uh, Zeni Trunfo Cortez, who is a uh, healthcare worker and a, a ranking member of the National of the Nurses Union in California, Willie Solis, a, a gig worker in Texas. Um, so I think like what really stood out to me was just um, first, you know, like how you can't try to capture the experience of COVID in one sweeping narrative. Right. Because so many people experienced it through the prism of their daily realities, their personal pathways to being the people that they are, the intricacies of their respective jobs and the, the kind of cultural and political and, and economic features of the places what, that they inhabit. All of this shapes, you know, the, the stories that the folks that I talked to for this book sort of tell me. Um, but I do think that the thing that really kind of binds all of them together is this sense of struggle, right? This this kind of awakening that COVID forced upon us, because I think a lot of us can forget that up until COVID-19, you know, the 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 common experience for so many of us who have worked low wage jobs was just to, again, like I said, be treated like we were worthless be told over and over again that we should be grateful for the jobs that we have, that we should consider ourselves lucky that we had those jobs, that we should feel ashamed and embarrassed for asking for more or let alone demanding more, right? Um, you know, that was really kind of like the common state of, you know, your average low-wage worker in this country before COVID. Then suddenly the system was forced to acknowledge that it needed us. Right. Mm -hmm. Same system that had spent all of our lives telling us that we were worthless pieces of shit suddenly started calling us essential. Right. Uh, you know, and, and like the media pundits, the politicians, the corporate executives, the folks who were able to work from home and ride this out uh, in their second or third homes. You know, like there was a real, I think, clear class divide um, that, that was made apparent in the first year of covid half, you know, the working population was able to work from home the other half was not and in fact kind of kept the rest of society afloat many of whom were frankly sacrificed on the front lines of you know a botched um response to the pandemic from the government side from the market side 
Um, you know, a lot of people never asked to be the heroes that they were celebrated as like they didn't want to be going out and working and putting their health at risk or their family's health at risk. But they had to because we live in a capitalist hellscape that gives working people no other option, especially after decades and decades of uh, deliberate erosion of the social safety net. We saw that in the early days of covid. Many people, my my family included could not get the unemployment checks that they desperately needed because the system essentially buckled in the first couple months of COVID, got better as we went along. But um, anyway, I guess to tie this up, I think that um, the, the way that, that that people notice that, you know, recognition from the system, like when when I, I think that it's understandable, especially for those of us on the left, to look askance at the term essential worker, right, and look mistrustfully at it and, and try to qualify it immediately. But I would just ask people to consider, like, what it does mean for, you know, your average working person who is in the sit kind of situation that I just described, um, almost overnight going from being treated like a piece of dirt to being like celebrated in the media as a frontline hero, like that does something to you. And you don't quite forget what that means. Um, and I do think that that sort of awakening, that sort of recognition of how essential we always have been to this system and how essential our labor always has been to keeping society running and how much more valuable to society as a whole working people are compared to the leeches and vampires uh, sucking up all the wealth uh, and, and hoarding all the power at the top. And so I think like over the past three years, like you've seen the, the, the kind of tension between those two things boiling over in interesting ways. You see it in the interviews for this book where, you know, people who have never had a chance to really stop and uh, uh, take a step back from the perpetual rat race because they were always living so close to the bone that if they missed a day of work, you know, that might mean that they couldn't make rent. The mean, meant that they couldn't buy this or that, you know, supply for their kids uh, uh, who needed it for school. Right. You know, like <clears throat> that was the situation that many, many people were in and in fact still are in. Um, but with the kind of covid era, you know, social aid that was provided um, and with the kind of circumstances that we were all in, some people did have the chance to actually not go into work and risk their their lives, but stay home, get extended unemployment benefits or reap or, you know, utilize the the the, the child uh, care tax credits or, you know, the stimulus checks, the pauses on student loan payments, the eviction moratoria like these things actually did have a significant impact on a significant number of people. And what I the way that I heard that in the book was that a lot of a number of folks kind of tell me you know, that when they had the opportunity to stop for a second um, because the social aid allowed them to, they thought, is this what I want to be doing with my life? Like if I died tomorrow because people around me are literally dying like all the time, like if that happened to me, would I be pleased with how I live my life? Should I, in fact, demand better at work or should I leave this job and find something better? Should I find something that allows me to be with my family more right it could so like that that tension right but that class struggle that covid really intensified and, and boiled over over the past three years i think it manifested in things like that which we then term like the great resignation with record numbers of people voluntarily quitting their jobs but it also manifested in uh, a kind of revivified uh, labor movement in this country, more folks um, actually banding together and trying to organize and unionize in their workplaces or existing unions uh, or unionized workforces um, going on strike. Right. I mean, like so you, you you have seen, I think, a lot of outcroppings of uh, that struggle by people who, um, you know, the system had to was forced to recognize as essential, but that same system has spent the past, you know, basically two years after year one of COVID trying to get us all to collectively unlearn that and 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 to erase that from our memory so we can go back to, to business as usual, 
where we're paid as little as they can possibly get away with, where we're treated uh, as poorly as they can get away with, and they can they can rob us blind, uh, you know, for as long as we'll let them get away with. Right. Well, I, there's so much to think about when I was thinking about the interviews in this. I mean, one, I will give you a lot of credit because these 10 selections are geographically, racially, gender diverse. Um, and sectorally diverse, and that's important. Um, there are a lot of projections of the working class is a lot more consistent right now than it actually is in any particular way. Uh, even, you know, because of American secession with with racial discourse for reasons that are totally sociologically rational. Um, I think there's a lot of focus on like the the BIPOC working class and the white working class, et cetera. But one of the things I think that your book actually brings out is that it's even more complicated than that. It, it really is different depending on the sector you're in, your habitats, et cetera. And that's also a theme that runs through your show. Um, and I think that's important to, to take up. And I think we're in an interesting time right now in a lot of ways, because on one hand, lo and behold, for me to give any credit to Trump or even Joe Biden, to be honest, but we had a social safety net forced upon us by people who clearly didn't want to do it. And then people who kind of wanted to do it, but were anemic about it. Um, and then we've also seen it kind of be taken away. Um and I think, depending on what happens with this court uh, thing that's literally going on right now with, with student loan forgiveness, uh, for a certain sector, it's going to be completely taken away. But there's a lot of people who weren't even going to get that. Um, so I think your book is actually interesting in that in that fact. I think it's also interesting that you focus on the, on some of the areas that are, when we talk about like, the laptop class or whatever has, has been picked up in certain circles on both the left and right recently. Uh, teachers and nurses and some of these people who are like, when people throw around PMC discourse, which is not a discourse I love, but are like liminal to that. Like, because on one hand, uh, teachers were at home. And uh, for an, on another hand, they weren't for very long. And there are things that COVID brought out, some of which were the result of being at home, but some of which actually accelerated things that were showing how fragile that system already was. And a whole lot of teachers have realized that. Now, that's the field I work in as my day job. So, of course, that's what I what I like naturally was like, Bruh! but also what it did to nursing we are still learning how fragile the front end element of our really expensive healthcare uh really is um and then you know the the nick galupo chapters i was like i didn't even think about grave diggers like i know like and i should have because it was a dark time um now you and I actually share a trait that we are both academics and those, you know, well, quasi-academics, para-academics in my case. Um, but I used to be an academic. And so do I, I'm a recovering academic. Right. Yeah, it's a bit, <laughs> we share that. And we're both also, I am technically second generation educated, but I got my degree this like almost at the same time as my mother got hers. So um we come from working class backgrounds. I actually, I remember listening to your first episode with your father and being very moved by it. Cause it reminded me of my relationship with my stepfather, who is a very different kind of man in a lot of ways, you know, um, uh, waspy, uh, mechanic who married into a mixed race, uh, a mixed race, partly Jewish, partly Catholic family. <laughs> but, um, it was nice to hear actual working class voices. And I remember just the first time I heard your show, I was like, no one, no one ever does this actually. It's like, it's, it, 
it's amazing to me we have an entire discourse around working class people in which working class people aren't self-represented that much at all and are used as a political and sociological like plaything and cipher um i have always found that Yes, the aggregate chins that a lot of academics talk about the working class are true in aggregate, but when you break it down in, in individual people, you do see you do see complications that are I think surprising um, and difficulties that I think are surprising. I remember during the first years of COVID discourse, like there was this undertone undercurrent of like who were the vaccine resistors when they first came out and who was not who was afraid of it and um the patterns of hesitancy were actually kind of misreported <laughs> during during the beginning um some of which was clearly political obviously and you know there's a whole class of like older petite bourgeois kind of people who uh, were resistant, but then actually the older in general were much more compliant than you would expect given their political affiliations. Um, and there are certain sectors of the country where even areas that would be considered somewhat progressive or, were hesitant and people didn't talk about why, like, are they, they just sort of like, well, you know, it's rational that people of color don't trust the state, but I'm like, yeah, but there's actually a different logic in a lot of these cases that it would be very helpful if you wanted to say, have something like medical equ equity or something at all, you know, even in our crappy capitalist system for us to have a, a more robust understanding of like, like for, for example, People in the Latin community and people in the black community may have similar hesitancies, but why they had those hesitancies, if you actually talk to people, were sometimes vastly different and, interestingly enough, went away pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so it's it's a thing that I that I think something like your book is actually really important. I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm also a believer in aggregate stats. I'm also a believer in like we have to look at that. Um, you know, lately I've been trying to wrap my head around the numbers coming out of uh, this, this current workers resurgence, which indicates that it's both real and not real simultaneously. And that's hard for even me to completely articulate what we should say. So what I mean by that, like there's clearly real anger and workers militancy approval of unions has shot up, uh, but union density has not, um, except in very specific, very at risk, uh, but also ten, uh, traditionally transient labor. Um, it's hard to know what to make of that, like, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we actually need stuff like these kind of profiles to start getting a feeling of how people are actually narrativizing this to themselves um, before we can say... Like, okay, we know what the statistics are. We know what the statistics tell us. And we do have to deal with that. But what are these What are these people thinking on an individual level? I, I always tell people, like, one of the things about American life, and this is actually a cross-class, that you can see trends in people and, and even, like, similar actions. But if you actually ask people what they think, you'll get, like, a thousand epistemologies, to use a big fancy word. Mm -hmm. But I think it's actually true. Like... Like how people explain what's going on to them, how they narrativize it to the self is often it's cultural, it's class based, but it's also a lot more granularly specific and sometimes personal than we give it space to be. And I find it interesting on the left, a left that is often somewhat obsessed with talking about lived experiences, how little we let people narrate their experience of class regardless of their their race gender or other backgrounds like that that is actually kind of and it's not because we don't talk about class it, it, that's not the issue it's more like there's something about narrativizing it that makes people uncomfortable in a way even maybe as much as race 
Yeah. I think that's true. And I mean, ultimately, when it comes down to it, for me at least, I tend to feel that, like, it really is at base an issue of respecting one another's humanity, right? And and respecting the fullness of that humanity. Like, actually recognizing that other people are as complex as you are that you are not the realest person in existence even though it seems that way because you've only ever lived your life you've only ever thought in your head you've only seen through your eyes it's natural just by virtue of being an individual human right that that we would perceive other people in such a skewed way because they do not we we don't have immediate access to others other people's interior monologues right uh to the things that and that they think and feel without even having to articulate them to themselves right i mean and that is what makes us kind of communal beings is we're kind of constantly trying to bridge that divide between selves there could be you know the width of a hair separating uh, our heads but we could be a universe apart in terms of knowing what's actually in uh, the other person's heart in their head in their background so on and so forth and to kind of wind that back even more right um i remember i know you've had um uh my boy jules taylor uh, our producer of our show host of no evil uh, no evil foods <laughs> no they're the shitty union busting company no easy answers <laughs> right. so, sorry jules <laughs> um but um you know like I think this is something that, that Jules and I may have talked about either in a bonus episode for working people or an episode of his show at some point. But like I speaking of being a, a recovering academic, um, you know, I very much consider myself like a Marxist humanist. And I know that that gets sort of uh, looked at in a certain way um, from other Marxists or other, you know, leftists, you know, like uh, depending on what the ideology they subscribe to or principles that they believe in. But like, to me, the humanist side of that is not some wishy washy, you know, touchy feely sort of like artistic air, you know, artistic, like paint brushes around the edges of Marx's materialism. It is fundamentally essential for me, at least to understanding what materialism is and how it works uh, and how the world works, because you don't, you don't have structures of society that work on their own they work through us they work through human beings just like uh revolution and revolt rebellion uh struggle is waged and lived through human lives and human bodies and human communities this is all part of it right like think back to this is what i would always talk to my students about we would get excited that was the one thing about academia that i really do miss is is being in the classroom with with students um, but I would say it's like, look, like the very concept of learning, like you, you spend the first 18 years of your life going to school, right? Because we acknowledge as people, as a society that like who you are uh, and who you're going to be is not programmed and hardwired into you from birth, right? You, we all come into this world not speaking a language, right? We have to, we have to spend years downloading that from our family from other people from school right you 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 download this tool this technology of language and then when you become self-possessed enough to use it to articulate yourself you start this lifelong process right of always kind of being caught in that sort of dialectical pole between uh, a language that you didn't come up with that has all this kind of historical um weight to it words have meanings that have been given to them over decades if not centuries if not millennia of use right i mean so you are using this technology that is more common to human beings in their social nature right but you yourself are using that to articulate your own personality your own selfhood your own thoughts your own feelings you imagine being across from like your high school crush and trying to articulate to them how you feel about them right i mean like that is i think a beautiful dialectical example right of how of what humanism means in the context of of marxism materialism just understanding how the world 
works, right? I mean, that's that's how I sort of view it, right? That, um, and then then you kind of like take that and apply it to kind of everything that we're sort of talking about here. Like you said, um, we don't even recognize one another in that way most of the time, right? I mean, we don't practice it. We don't talk to each other in that deep sort of way. We don't, uh, we don't, we don't like reveal that much of ourselves to people in daily life, right? I mean, we are very, and this is what I think Marx meant by alienation, right? I mean, meant many things by it, but I think this is one of the ways it manifests, right? In, in just those sorts of social connections that we have to one another or that we want to have with one another and kind of being closed off um, usurped by relations of exchange, right? And, and uh, you know, working for a wage, paying a landlord. You only really get to know one another because, you know, you know this person as a barista who serves your coffee. You don't know them beyond that point, right? Or you know this person as a healthcare worker who, you know, uh, uh, checks your temperature, but you don't know what happens to them, you know, after you leave that hospital room, right? All these sorts of ways that our vision of each other and our understanding of one another and our understanding of our place in a collective society is severed, right? And we're all kind of try to, you know, we're encouraged to believe that we are just these sort of like lone individuals moving through space um, without that world actually shaping who we are at every term, um, and, and that there are ways that we can, in fact, push against that and open our abilities to commune with one another, to think differently, to love differently, right? To, to produce economically, you know, like to produce the, 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 the economic necessities that we all depend on differently, right? I mean, that, again, is the sort of dialectical struggle that I understand Marx to be talking about and I understand it to be playing out through right the 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 kind of flesh and blood uh, embodiments <laughs> of of the material world that we all are um, but I think like when it comes down to it you have to pay that respect to yourself and to other people to understand that there is that kind of uh, ineradicable kernel of human agency and yearning and uh, desire to be more, than you know what the world that we are born into wants us to be right that is the struggle to find ourselves that every one of us is engaged in in one way or another and when those struggles become intertwined in a class sense right when we realize that in fact the ways that uh the 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 kind of system of economic production the you know political apparatuses the media apparatuses the military apparatuses that build around that to protect those primary relations of production and so on and so forth right the more that we realize that those things are kind of forming this interlocking system that is stunting our potential that is limiting our growth right that is in fact um you know forestalling our ability to flourish and live the lives that we yearn for, when we can kind of unite those yearnings, when we can kind of see how we are all, in fact, kind of being conditioned by these larger structures, and we can fuse our individual struggles as part of a collective working class, right? That is where you get the real eruptions of history. That is how we try, I hope, to move history forward. And I think that you do see that, you know, and even in the darkest of times, you're right. Um, you know, like uh, I would say just from, again, like the over 300 interviews we've published on my podcast, Working People, countless interviews that I've done here at The Real News, the 10 for this book, and just the ones that I get into with, with folks, you know, every day, like take that for what it's worth. It's not worth everything, you know. A lot of it is anecdotal. A lot of it is person specific. But I mean, I would say that that based on what I hear from folks and what I feel from folks like you're right, there is something real here. There is this kind of tangible and widespread sense that uh, we as a society are not going in the right direction, um, that um, there are you know things that we can actually do about it. Um, but you know, like there's still a lot of ground to cover. 
Um, you know, even if like the union density is barely hovering above 10 percent, as you said, and dismal in the private sector, you know, that doesn't mean that people don't struggle. Right. People will non-unionized workers will walk out on the job um, if they feel unsafe. Right. You know, a, a lot of the Starbucks workers have been doing that uh, and not just them. Right. I mean, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, generally only tracks like labor actions that involve a thousand or more workers. So they're not tracking the smaller strikes and worker actions like you. They're, they're great trackers like the uh, Cornell School of Labor and Industrial Relations tracker that actually does track smaller strikes and, and stuff like that. So I'd tell, uh, recommend folks check that out uh, as well. But even again, just just the on an individual level, right? Standing up for yourself at work, right? Telling your boss, hey, you can't talk to me that way, right? Or sticking up for a coworker who's being harassed by a manager. You know, maybe there's some creep manager who just keeps sexually harassing your colleague. And then you and your coworkers like band together and say, like, we're watching you. You need to stop it. We're going to report you, right? Again, that's that, that just that struggle takes place in so many different realms because the opposite is just acceptance the opposite is just complacency the opposite is just it's not my problem they're not my problem all i can do is focus on what's in front of me but anyway this sorry that was a, a tangent no it's a, it's it's a good one i mean a lot of what i aim to do here is to complicate our narratives for a purpose of clarity so i often tend to cut against common things on the left but i'm very i get very worried when people take it away from me for example if i say well the union movement isn't what you think it is but then they don't hear the second part of that there is something real very real going on right now that we haven't seen in a while what what is what i think people miss and this is something that i think your book actually gets to the experience of in these profiles and these interviews um, is the, the tension uh, the the, to use a, you know, Marxist word that I actually hate being used in common parlance, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, dialecticalness of specifically the COVID moment. At one moment, we have the closest thing to, to, to social welfareism that we've seen since the great society. Uh-huh. Uh, and at the at the same moment, right, we have the largest wealth transfer upwards that I think we have seen in a short period of time, maybe ever. Um, and that people were living that and experiencing that. And I know a lot of people who it was a profound emotionally disturbing thing. Another thing that comes up in your interviews, but I, I know people have talked about it in in the chat as well. Um, we had generous, uh, generous uh, unemployment for the first time ever. And yet a lot of people who were entitled to it, depending on the state they were in, if they were in Southern or Western states, for example, particularly ones that are not particularly rail one and often have legislature. It's only meant for a few months of year and they don't have like, like I, I had a very close friend of mine in Ohio, working mother who would would literally five kids. That's not an exaggeration. It took three months for her to get any of those temporary unemployment checks, and by the time she got them, she was already back to work. Like those kinds of things, I think it made a lot of people feel crazy in addition to the fact that what was going on if you're in the developed world like the united states and i don't think people realize how lucky we've been because i've spent a lot of time outside of the united states and some of this i'm like well i've seen some of this before but if you're here like this feels apocalyptic to a lot of people they've not seen us get hit by a pandemic in this way and I also think that explains even parts of the working class. I mean, wh one of the things I could tell you about a lot of people I know here who are who are who are gig workers, they weren't they weren't virus deniers in the way that you hear, but a lot of them did become a lot more cavalier because they're like, I've been exposed to this for months and I've seen people die and 
I just don't trust that they're going to do anything for us, really. Like, and I also think that experience is very different regionally because I was talking to people from like the Northeast and even even workers, you know, people who were not high wage. Uh, they didn't quite have the same kind of fatalism about it, which means they actually took slightly more precautions. Um, and these things, I even like tried to, you know, put the, the great, you know, controversy, you know, at the end of the first year was the trucker strike. And I have my whole thing about the structural reason why I think truckers tend to be a little bit more reactionary than a lot of other uh, things. But even then I was trying to get people to understand, like from the individual truckers perspective, right. This affects them differently because they're in a cab by themselves moving in not highly populated areas. And so it doesn't seem like the same risk to them as it might from the standpoint of the whole system. I do think you should have some compassion for that, right? Even if you structurally know that, okay, well, you know, traditionally, if you want a, a, a strike to go reactionary, you use a truck or strike, like, like literally it's in, it's in COINTEL pro playbooks. And the reason why is they're usually somewhere between petty proprietors, but and, and workers, but, I'm still like trying to emphasize like these are still people you even if you disagree with their politics, even if you think their politics right now is very dangerous, you in some ways have to extend some solidarity to why they are doing that, even if you think what they are doing is politically astroturfed and kind of reactionary. Um, and this is something I think I found really both in your book and actually in your show, the more so a relief because sometimes you know what I'm talking about. There's like a tendency on the socialist left to pretend like there aren't reactionary workers. Like, and you and I both know that's full of shit. <laughs> like, it's like, yeah, there are. It's it's not, but it's not inherent like that. And even in a lot of cases with the quote reactionary workers, just to be fair, the co the actual opinions they have are more complicated. And if you were to give them time to unpack them there would be more points for solidarity with groups that they do not necessarily automatically see solidarity with. And if you, if you just treat it as a binary game where workers are reactionary, no, they're not like that. That's actually kind of a useless conversation. I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like, you know, I think your discussion again, bring it back to, to that first episode of working people podcast, your discussion with your dad is really, nuanced in that way like like it like you know your dad's kind of small c conservative like yeah i mean we talk about i mean he's a mexican immigrant first president he ever voted for when he became a citizen was reagan and we talk at the end of that episode about why he voted for donald trump i grew up very conservative um you know and i feel like I'm actually gr quite grateful for that because I feel like when you make that kind of journey, it doesn't have to necessarily be an ideological one, but when you're the frame of understanding the world that you have and that, that feels so that you feel so comfortable within, like when you change that over the course of time and you can sort of, it's as much of a distance as you're ever going to get when you're evaluating yourself. Cause most of the time, like, what, what is the kind of the, the phrase, right? Ideology is always what the other guy has. Like no one sees themselves as being ideological. I'm just being myself, right? <laughs> you know, like that's, you know, ideology doesn't touch me. It touches the people who are acting differently from me because they're acting, they must be acting ideological, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I think that like just making the journey over the course of my life from being a very staunch conservative, being one of those kind of, uh, conservative assholes in high school who just love to sort of piss off my liberal classmates, not necessarily because I was so thoroughly invested in whatever political view I was espousing, but because like all high school students, I was involved in this kind of, you know, social arms race, jockeying for position, looking for, you know, pleasure and, and uh, communal belonging with friends who would laugh at my jokes, racial belonging, because being the conservative Mexican guy and kind of making self-deprecating jokes like, you know, my white conservative friends absolutely loved that. Right. Um, and uh, from anyway, we don't have to go into into all of that. But like there are a lot of different reasons for people doing the things that they do. 
Um, you know, it's not all just that we're brainwashed, right? You know, <clears throat> and again, I think that it really, my, I don't have answers to everything, but my North Star, you know, when I try to approach any sort of situation and, and offer an analysis or, or figure out how I'm going to move through it is to just start with that basic core premise of respecting the complexity and agency uh, of other human beings. Um, and I think that, like you so rightly pointed out, the absence of that creates so many problems for us, not just on the left, but definitely on the left, right? When we have, uh, 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 when, we, when we don't have these kinds of voices on the records, when we don't take the time to talk to our coworkers, our neighbors, um, you know, the, the, the people who live around us, right? When we don't get to know our family better, um, you know, when, when we just don't, again, like act as if other people are as interesting and worth knowing about as we believe ourselves to be, you know, you really get a very limited view of, of the world and of other people. And then you start to color that in with these, you know, broad sweeping generalizations. I did it all the time as a conservative. I mean, we all do. It. We still do it. Right. I mean, it's, I think, again, it's it's I won't say human nature, but I think it's a natural thing to do when you have a world with, you know, with eight billion, eight billion people. Right. It's it's almost impossible for us to sort of apply that type of empathetic understanding of the complexity of each human being within that global sphere. That's as, that's as unimaginable to us as the size of the universe. Right. So we have to ultimately work within the confines of our human psychologies. Um, but I do think that you do see the world differently when you you kind of learn to listen to other people, when you learn to sort of consider, even if, as you said, you very much disagree, right, or, or even recoil at what you're hearing, it does benefit you to know, understand where another person is coming from, why they think the things that they do, um, and to actually understand what it is they are telling you, what it is they are trying to argue for what they believe the good version of society actually looks like because at base you are not going to be under able to organize anyone you're not going to be able to mobilize anyone you're not going to be able to build a big enough coalition to change the world that i think we all acknowledge needs changing you're not going to be able to do that if you don't work with people again this is my humanism equals materialism plea you cannot change history. You cannot move that dialectical force in the direction of progress towards a more equitable society if you are not working with the people around you, if you are not actually working every day to build a proletarian sense of class consciousness and to focus our collective attention and energies towards the very real enemies of the people. And I think I would say in that regard, you're right. I mean, like sociologically, it is very important going to what, you know, I think that's where you, what you said and what I said, like really connect is I do think that the different gradations of class, the different types of jobs people have, the types of neighborhoods that they live in, all these things shape what our politics are, right? They shape, you know, what we prioritize, right? What sorts of things we're going to vote for or people we're going to vote for, what we're not going to vote for, right? And at times they do put us fundamentally at odds with one another. Those need to be struggled over. Those differences need to be struggled over. They need to be overcome somehow. But I think we can lose the forest from the trees when we get caught up in, I don't know, the PMC discourse or whatever discourse of the day it is when we lose sight of the very real fact that as the, the great speech in the movie Mate One says, there are two types of people in this world, people who work and people who don't. You work, they don't. They are the leeches. They are the ones who are sucking all of the trillions of dollars of wealth out of our society like you just said. What was it? I mean, like, I, I think I just saw Ralph Nader today tweet like uh, about the White House's latest figure that like most of the profits from like the past two years have like all gone to stock buybacks and shareholder mm -hmm. dividends. Like they, it is a literal kind of leeching system where this small handful of people and companies, uh, multinational <laughs> corporations are draining the, the, the collective resources out of our society. They can't 
reintegrate the that wealth those resources back into the real economy so they create this kind of fictive casino financialized economy uh where th that generates more and more wealth for them but when it crashes we all get fucked from that right so like that is the bigger picture that is like what we are up against we can we can if we are talking about you know how truckers fit into this class con this class movement or healthcare workers other types of white collar workers undocumented workers prison workers my colleague and comrade Eddie Conway who was framed by Cointel Pro member of the Black Panther party here in Baltimore wrongfully imprisoned for 44 years of his life released in 2014 he I got to I got to work with him for a few short years, but he just passed away. I mean, this guy was organizing labor unions in prison because he understood the role that prison labor, slave labor has in the larger kind of capitalist system. So if we are talking about those types of different gradations of class, the different types of interests that you develop if you were working in this or that type of environment, um, and, and if we are talking about those things in terms of how to overcome them to unite or at least inoculate a broad class movement that can actually attack and overwhelm and overthrow the capitalist hegemonic system that we currently live in, the imperialist war machine that it uses to impose its will throughout the world, right? If we're not doing that, but if we're instead focusing on those kind of differences between the the very great the varying gradations of working class people again the class of people who work versus the the smaller class of people who own the class of the 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 order givers versus the order taking class right if we're not ultimately talking about how to stop that order giving class and how to overthrow this larger system then i don't necessarily know what we are um, talking about. And I hope that the conversations that I have, like this has been a very political uh, goal of mine ever since I started the show. I was, I was very mindful of the voices that I have on. That's why I'll never have a cop on the show, frankly, but like everyone else I try to have on the show, right? I mean, um, because I try, I don't ever want to define who and what the working class is. I want people who listen to my show or read this book or watch the real news to kind of gradually build a collective, ever-evolving, ever-growing sense of what unites us in our experience of class, right? Mm -hmm. What sorts of issues we actually can rally around, mobilize around, organize around, um, what sorts of things can help us bridge those very real divides in political ideology. You're, you're absolutely right. There are always going to be reactionary guys on the shop floor. Like, I used to be one of them. And I, and I used to work with a lot of assholes too, or sometimes they were right. And I was the asshole when I became like more of a left leaning guy. Right. I mean, like, again, you got to work with people. You can't, there's no shortcut as Jane McAlevey would say, right. You know, like you actually have to work with the people that you're in. And that's why I think labor organizing for as far as we have to go in this country and beyond is still a very real important arena of struggle. Because you have, to, if you want to win, you have to work with the people in your shop. You have to figure out. Um, there's a great uh, uh, line. I was recently doing a live show of working people in New York at the People's Forum, and so like Chris Smalls was there, Vince Kiles, the the guy who led the union drive at at the Home Depot in in mm. Philly. It was unsuccessful, but Vince is an incredible guy. You know, we had folks organizing at Trader Joe's in mini, Minneapolis, Starbucks here in Baltimore, and, um, you know, a member of Labor's Local 79, the Construction Workers Union in New York City. Um, Toph, Toph had a really great line about this, right? Of I've, I'm going to butcher it, but he said something to the effect of like a lesson a, his organizing mentor taught him, which is like, you know, in any, in any shop, in any workforce, you're going to have kind of like this this top layer of folks who are more intellectually close to each other. Like that's ultimately who's going to be like your organizing committee. You guys are more simpatico with it. You're going to have this vast swath in the middle of people who are kind of like, maybe they're more sympathetic or maybe they're just not going to get in your way. And then you're going to have this other layer of the snitches, the people who are actively antagonistic to the organizing. And so what Toph said, again, I'm butchering it, is like, 
you need to bring the people in the first group together to organize the people in the middle group and isolate the people in the third group, right? You have, you have to like, you know, there, there are a lot more people who can be on our side if we are organized, if we are empathetic, if we actually treat each other in that sort of like real respectful human way if we acknowledge that your liberation and my liberation our struggles for liberation are bound up together and the more free you are the more free i can be right if we actually bring you know that out in collective struggle we can isolate those people on the shop floor who think that i don't know the fucking the trans worker uh, uh, uh on the shop is like the reason that we're all not getting raises right or the black person in the shop floor is the is the problem not the boss right you can isolate those assholes if you build collective strength with everyone else in the shop and i think that there's a lesson to be learned there more broadly about a class based politics you're not going to be able to win over everyone including you know like the reactionary like workforce but the point is to bring in as many people who can be brought in right and to learn from that struggle like we don't always have the answers but if we know what our ultimate goal is and if we know that we can't get to that goal unless we work together and if we don't work together in a way that allows us to actually stand for something and fight for something and build real robust lasting power and build the infrastructure we need to keep that power uh to give that power staying power right if we're clear about that then i think that we can win but we we have to do the actual work. And I think that talking to each other the way that I try to do the way and what I do is what organizers do every day. I try to take like making media is not organizing, but I try to bring an organizer's mindset to making media because I think it you you produce different kinds of media. Um, and so I, I hope that, you know, at least in some tiny infinitesimal sense the kinds of conversations that I've given people access to, the kinds of stories that they get to hear from other workers on my show at The Real News in this book. I hope that it at least like, you know, inspires people to get in one more type of conversation with your coworkers about that. You know, strike up a conversation uh, about, you know, if your buddy's having a hard time at work, talk to him about it. You know, be a listening ear, right? I mean, it's not going to change the world, but the more of us who do it, the closer that we're actually going to be to building the kind of class-based movement that we actually need. Yeah. Uh, I guess to turn it back to the book just for a second, um, what did you learn from these profiles that surprised you? Hmm. There's a lot that surprised me. And I think like to to hook it back into the 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 kind of more theoretical discussion that that we've been having is like it, it surprised me to see how simple like some of this, the, the questions that can feel so insurmountable to us when we're just kind of mulling them over in our head or talking with our comrades, you know, about, you know, which are this or that theorist had it right. Uh, if you actually just talk to people, you see that um, it's not that hard, like, you know, or it's not as complicated as you think it is, right? Even kind of the things that we've been talking about, about like, how race and gender and ethnicity and location, language, generation, like none of these things are class as such, right? But all of them as like, you know, intersectionality kind of like shows us like they all are vectors through which class is mediated, right? They are ways that inflect our experience of class. And you can explain, you know, like the ways that people are, the way they act, the way they feel without understanding that complexity. And I'll give you a couple of examples there, right? So like for folks who may get really caught up as I have done many times in the past when I was trying to kind of develop my own thinking on this, they say like, well, well, what determines, what shapes people's actions more, right? Their class position or their racial identity or their gender identity. And it's kind of like, yes, right? is the answer, right? But like, again, they, they, they converge in really interesting ways. Some examples that I can actually give here to make that point. One, uh, I asked Zeni Triunfo Cortez, right, uh, who is Filipina, uh, Filipina-American, um, 
I remember talking to her about this before we actually recorded the interview because I wanted to know if she was willing to talk about it. But I was like, I'm reading these reports that like a shockingly high number of healthcare worker deaths have been Filipinos in this country. Why is that? Like why? Well, like frontline healthcare workers are bearing the brunt of this pandemic. So I would expect, you know, to suffer a lot of casualties there, which we did not just in people who died, um, but in a lot of people who left the industry altogether, as you said, like we are hemorrhaging healthcare workers because we have treated them like shit. We have overwhelmed the hospitals. We have made nurses have untenable nurse to, to patient ratios. We have let profit seeking companies like tenant healthcare, which own the, the, the investor owned healthcare giant that owns St. Vincent hospital in Worcester, Massachusetts, where nurses wage the longest nurses strike in the state's history last year at St. Vincent hospital over uh, safe staffing ratios, so on and so forth. Anyway, so like we have a real crisis in the healthcare system, just like we do in that, in the education sector, so on and so forth. But there still was a way that Zenny lays out very kind of matter of factly. This is what I mean when I say, oh, maybe it's not as kind of insurmountable or as complicated as, as I am making it out to be in my head. But Zenny kind of does talk about in her mind why she thinks that um, more of those deaths uh, were by Filipino American healthcare workers. She said, first of all, you know, like we, we do t in the schools that like we have, in the Philippines, like you tend to get trained for the more uh, like the types of departments that were taking in all the the COVID patients. Right. Um, so these aren't like necessarily wards or, or wings where you're doing elective surgeries. These are ICUs. Right. Where a, a larger percentage of Filipinos and Filipino American healthcare workers get trained. Um, and then she also talks about just kind of like how culturally. Right. It's very you know, embedded for people like Zany to, you know, not leave a patient when there's not another person uh, in the ward to take over for your shift. So you will, in fact, stay longer than you need to. You will sacrifice more than you're supposed to because, you know, they people like Zany don't want to just kind of leave these COVID patients without a nurse on hand. Right. I mean, but these are just a couple of examples that she gives that help you understand. It's like, OK, well, yeah, the culture, the ethnicity and the class, like they converge in this really important way that helps us understand this phenomenon that we're reading about in the news. Another one is Chili Yazi um, from the Navajo Nation, who I interview in this book. Chili is an incredible human being, lived an incredible life. I mean, he 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 was touring with the American Indian Movement rock band uh, Exit for a while, and then he ended up serving many decades in like, you know, the Navajo council government. I mean, he's just, and now he's a farmer, right? He's a really, really incredible and interesting person who Francis Madison, actually, uh, um, brought us together for this episode, uh, because she reviewed my book in Strange Matters, Francis actually introduced me to Chile, and I'm incredibly grateful to her for that. But he lays out in there, right, why you saw such a spike in um, COVID infections and deaths in Navajo Nation in the early days of COVID. We all were reading about it. Um, and he does acknowledge that, yeah, in certain circles, there was a lot of vaccine hesitancy. Um, but he's also like, after centuries of colonial domination and you know, like despoiling our lands and like giving us like such a skewed economic chessboard to play on, you know, like that, it, that factors into like how the Pueblo communities, how the, uh, the Navajo uh, uh, reservation communities like have developed over the years, why you see multiple generations living in the same household, right? And, you know, part of it is cultural, part of it is economic. But basically what Chile says is like when we needed people to isolate, where are they going to isolate when you've got three generations living all together in like a two bedroom house? You're not going to be able to isolate. So that, again, is a way that you see the legacy of colonialism, the legacy of, you know, capitalism, um, but also like the kind of internal cultural dynamics kind of, you know, really fusing together to help us once again explain a certain phenomenon. I could go, I could go on and on again, but I, I, I do think that what I hope that, that people get from reading these interviews, as I said, and as I, I say in the introduction is like, 
you know, I don't want people to look at any one of these interviews as like a metaphor for like Chile Yazi is not speaking for all Navajo people, right? Zeni is not speaking for all Filipino, you know, like uh, healthcare workers, like they're speaking for themselves, right? But through what the stories that they are telling, right? There's still something that you can feel so attached to that you can feel so connected to that resonates so much with so many of us, right? And that, I think like it's in incumbent upon all of us to try to kind of find those types of things, find those types of connections that we can have with others um, and build on those. Because again, that is the raw human stuff that we're going to need to actually forge bonds of solidarity that are durable enough to withstand uh, everything the ruling class is going to throw at us, that, that is going to withstand the trials, the tribulations, the, the struggles that we are going to face if we are actually going to get where we need to go, if we are going to roll back and overthrow this planet-destroying capitalist system that is driving us towards species suicide, right? And that is already like you know, eliminating species around the planet. I mean, like we are in real, real dire fucking times here. And so like, I'm trying to look for anywhere that I can see the potential for growth of a class movement, the potential for people, working people, regular people realizing that it is within our power to change history, that we have it within ourselves to be the agents of change in the world that we inhabit. And we need to do that by, and by any means possible, I think. And I think we need as many of us doing that work, talking to one another, actually like trying to organize in our workplaces, but also bring the labor movement in more direct conversation with the climate justice movement, with the housing justice movement. Anywhere there are people fighting for good, we can band together. We can at least build those bonds of solidarity to effectively create a broader front against right the system that is oppressing all of us and the ruling class that is killing all of us frankly agreed um i know you've had a long day so i'm gonna we were both commiserating on that earlier um <laughs> yeah apologies to everyone if like if if i'm just spewing gobbledygook at this point like i've been really looking forward to this but i am quite dead <laughs> so I, <laughs> I apologize um so i guess i want to ask you where do you think this book will need a follow-up soon given how much the conditions have changed in the last say year and a half because I I, I I feel like something has well we all know that something has substantially changed in this period from both before covid and whatever neoliberal hellscape that we are to our current question mark question mark question mark hellscape they were currently in mm -hmm. um Do you, you know, do you think we're going to need to really kind of follow up and explore where this is going? Um, although I do want to, I'm going to give an anecdote though about, you know, interestingness and like they say, indigenous vaccine hesitancy. I worked a lot with the DNA Nation during the high point of the, of the pandemic. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that we learned about why they didn't trust uh, the, the CDC is the CDC didn't take Indian country conditions into account at all. So the guidelines for washing hands were based on the assumption that most of the areas had warning weather and plumbing, which if anybody would know what the federal government has allotted to a lot of the reds lands, uh, there is not running water and plumbing. Um, and it took a, a couple of friends of mine. Uh, che Moroni uh, was one of the, the, the key ones. Um, Moroni Benali. Um, and they realized that, like, no, we needed to put hand sanitizer in the washing basin because, and that's because the guidelines that they gave to, to the, uh, to the, to all the reses actually were the same guidelines they gave to everybody, but without any consideration of what their specific conditions were. And I was like, no wonder they don't trust 
mm-hmm. the, you know, the federal government for, for, for much. Um, and, and once they figure that out with, and it's, it's a very small trick, just d- don't use hand soap because it puts the, it puts the virus back into the water. Uh, alcohol denatures the virus. It, 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 so it's, it's more effective if you're using the same water and it's not freely drained. Um, it's a very small thing, but if you're not thinking about these conditions, you won't suggest it at all. Um, and the, the deaths went down dramatically, but you know, a lot of my friends in that community are highly traumatized now because so, I mean, I literally knew, you know, somebody who lost all of the elder members of his family mm-hmm. in a year. Like, so, you know, like his dad, mom, um, couple uncles, cousins, etc., all gone. Um, and and a lot of it was very early on. Um, and so, you know, I really thought, oh, you know, if anybody had just asked this specific section of this community what was actually going on, or you know, I don't know, the federal government done its fucking job. Um, a whole lot of of spread would have been prevented and a whole lot of elderly death would have been prevented. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the indigenous community. I mean, I think about like um, a lot of the elderly in, in, in the beginning who were in homes were just totally tossed to the wolves. Um, and, you know, the politicization of the CDC hadn't stopped since we got rid of Trump. I mean, like the the, the guidelines seem to literally be based on who's like who's annoying the democratic party at the most in any given time with governor's phone calls or whatever <laughs> like like and i mean it sounds cynical but it's also kind of true and that's and so you know we have, we have to understand that if we're going to respond to that but i guess to lead back to the question I originally asked um what do you think we need to follow up on you know now that this now that the conditions have really we're not in the high point things have moved on we um people have moved on and everything's still going on it's not like covid is going away in fact we you know it is part of probably part of our new normal now mm-hmm. um and there are other new divisions in 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 the class uh, in the working class as a broad whole that we didn't have before like there is a way in which there's whole classes of people who stay home and whole classes of people who can't and then there's also the way that our current reactions to inflation is like disciplining parts of the labor force that have not been disciplined before. I think of like massive layoffs in tech where no one else is getting laid off. Right. Like, so what do you think we need to look at in, in talking to individual people to build a picture of what they're thinking in, in the near future? Because, you know, this, the book you wrote is already, in some ways dated even though it's brand new (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's a great way to put it and like and i think like yeah like um i find that not so much depressing as as motivating right because i as i say in the introduction to this book and as i know i've said many times in interviews and on my show working people is like i i do not want to give people the sense that i a am the only person doing this work because i'm not Uh, Or that I should be, you know, if that were the case. But in fact, we need everyone doing this kind of work. Again, even if you don't publish it on a podcast or in a book, um, you will be shocked at how much your world changes if you actually take the time to talk to your coworkers about uh, their families, what they're going through in their lives outside of work, and also like what is pissing them off at work, right? Um, I would, I would, uh, point folks to the interview that we just published at the Real News Network uh, yesterday with Vince that I got to conduct with Vince Keyless, uh, the Home Depot worker in Philly, who was actually fired uh, recently and a few weeks after we recorded that interview. But I mean, you you will just feel the energy coming off of Vince and you will hear through his own personal experience trying to organize his shop, how much that organizing changed him, how much he learned about his co-workers and how much he learned about the struggle and how, you know, much hearing Vince talk about that 
invites you as a listener, you as someone who also is dealing with crap at work, you who also feels like we could create a better world than the one that we have now, right? Hearing people like Vince really kind of in invites you to kind of, you know, get involved however you can. And I think that talking to one another is where it has to start um, because we don't know where to go. We won't know how far we have to go. We won't know, you know, like how much strength we all actually have or whether we're all thinking similar things, like what sorts of gaps in uh, ideology or, or concern do we need to overcome to be able to organize as a workforce, as a class, right? You, you, if you, if we only pontificate about those questions without ever actually hearing from our fellow workers, but we just, again, we sort of paint them over with these broad strokes. We essentialize one another. We, we, we kind of try to categorize each other in these big definitional boxes, right? We're going to miss the stuff that we need to be able to see to actually effectively organize a response to the capitalist eco side of our shared species, our species and our shared planet, yada, 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 right? So it's like baby steps to the revolution, I feel. Because it's not just that, when I say baby steps to the revolution, I think you'll be surprised at how quickly things can spark from there. This is what Starbucks workers tell me all the time. Like they saw the win in Buffalo a little over a year ago. They started turning to their coworkers and having the kinds of conversations that they never had before. Four weeks later, they were voting in a union election, right? Things can move quickly if you actually have those types of conversations because you'll realize, I think, A, that you have so much more in common with each other than you thought you did, um, that you don't hate each other as much as you thought you did, right? Or that there, there are fewer people in your job that you hate than you thought you did, right? Um, you know, not saying there won't be any, but like, yeah, I think that that however many of us can actually be doing this work and engaging in the patient, tender, loving. I think there has to be love in it. There has to be love for our fellow human beings, right? Love for humanity as such and a belief that we do deserve better than this, human and non-human life, right? I mean, if you, if you really kind of push forward from there and you can get in tough conversations, you can get in disagreements, you could even, you know, get into tussles and struggles, heated debates with one another, but you can overcome them as long as you keep those things front and center and we, you remember who our enemies really are. And so I think that that work needs to be happening every, you know, everywhere that it can um, in our local spheres. Um, you know, if there are people who are on strike in your neighborhood, go to the picket line and find out why. Just talk to them, hear them. You will, all, you will not just for your own edification, but you will be amazed at how much it means to people who are walking that picket line, right? To, to, to feel heard, to feel seen, to feel supported. Look at the coal miners in Alabama. You want to talk about people who we like love to kind of parade around as political puppets. I remember this even when I was a conservative, like after Al Gore, you know, came out with a, a, an inconvenient truth, every goddamn election cycle, Republicans loved going to Kentucky or Alabama or West Virginia and taking pictures with the humble coal miner and say, we're going to save your jobs, right? You know, the Democrats want to regulate your livelihood out of existence. And yet here we are for the past two years, a thousand union coal miners in deep red Alabama at Warrior Met Coal have been on strike. Republicans abandoned them. Democrats abandoned them. The media largely abandoned them. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the community and, you know, the community of folks within the union. Also folks like the Birmingham DSA, right? Local churches, like people sending in money from around the country and beyond. That really helped to keep them going as long as they did. Right. And, and, you know, even if like a lot of them are conservative, are, you know, God fearing Republicans, I like, you know, Kim Kelly and I talked to a lot of these folks, Jacob Morrison at the Valley Labor Report, like we, we, we talked and covered to them and covered this for years. And like, we like them, like we're friends with a lot of them. We're like, you know, like I love a lot of these people, even if I disagree with like their views on like the presidency. Right. I mean, like, but I think that's where, again, you, that class struggle can really kind of fuse into something that is stronger than just the spoken word of solidarity. You can make solidarity manifest. You can make it material. You can 
build it and actually maintain it and fortify it in the relationships that we have with one another by doing that kind of work. Yes, it needs to happen in media too. I already like have like, I want to do a bunch more books like this, maybe not necessarily on the, like with the pandemic being the kind of like, you know, center of everything. But I just, mm -hmm. I, I feel like perhaps I found a, a calling or an area that I can be useful in, uh, in the short time that I have on this earth to try to kind of honor people's humanity and have these kinds of humanizing conversations, preserve them for future generations, um, preserve, you know, and, and that, that complexity, that richness of every person's backstory, uh, and the story that they have to tell. Right. I do also think, um, you know, that, uh, you're right that, that like, um, I wanted to, to do this book at the end of year one of COVID because I could already see in those first months of COVID from the spring and summer to the fall of 2020, I could see how quickly we were developing a sort of amnesia, a forced amnesia. This was an amnesia that was reinforced by the media class, by the political class. This was something that the ruling class ultimately wanted us to forget, right? I mean, like, I think that we came to accept during COVID things that were understandably horrifying and fundamentally unacceptable to us in the beginning, right? Like the buckling of the unemployment system or the fact that so many people were ineligible to receive those benefits. Um, you know, it's, it's, that initial shock and horror that we had when we were all like, oh, my God, those people aren't going to get unemployment benefits. What's going to happen to them? Or, oh, my God, this workforce isn't getting PPE. What if they get infected and die? And it just felt like the news kept coming and, and the, 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 the COVID response kept like steamrolling in a certain direction that we couldn't hang on to all those concerns at once. And we were also worried about ourselves. So we started to forget why we were horrified in the first place. And I wanted to do these interviews and publish this book so that we could always go back to it and remember what those days were like. Remember what shocked and horrified us when companies like Amazon, you know, gave their workers, quote unquote, hero pay, got a bunch <laughs> of good publicity about it, and then ripped that hero pay away from their workers like a month later. They should not be forgiven for that. They should never, and we should never forget what they did uh, to their workers, right? So I, I wanted to preserve that moment in time, understanding that by the time it did get published, it was already going to be out of date. I think there's something important in preserving who we were and what we were thinking and feeling at that moment in the year one of COVID. But I understand how folks may feel like, I don't know, like I've had some people not accuse me, but I mean, like essentially say like, oh, like, why don't you talk about the, the, anti-lockdown protests or the, you know, the, the, the anti-vax kind of side of things or, or, or any of that. And I was like, because it wasn't part of the conversation at that point, or I'm not saying it wasn't, it did not come up with any of these workers. Like, I think we can kind of like forget again, the timeline of events. But when I was talking to folks uh, during year one of COVID, like that wasn't a big thing on people's minds. People were just freaking out about how they were going to survive, how they were going to keep a roof over their head, whether or not they were going to bring the virus home to their families, right? So that was important to preserve in this book. But I do think that, yeah, like as we continue to march down into the gullet of a pretty horrifying century, we need more of these voices on the record. We need more people with different interview styles, with access to different kinds of folks, having these kinds of conversations, publishing them, preserving them, sharing them. I think that that is important. I've devoted my life to it. And I'm not so uh, up my own ass as to think that like, just because I'm doing it, that doesn't, that means that no one else can do it. I don't want anyone else to do it. I want to be the guy who's recognized as like the person who talks to workers. Like, no, we all need to be talking to each other. We, again, and if this is more than just my career, my brand, if this is actually something that is essential, I believe, to building that movement that we need to build to save our world and our species and to build a better world, then I think I, then I would rightly want everyone who is going to approach that work with the kind of care that I think it needs to be approached with, I want everyone doing that. Uh, and so I hope that, that if nothing else, my book inspires folks to at least 
turn to their neighbors, their family members, their coworkers, have those kinds of conversations. If not, record them, publish them, put them in a book form. But we need more of it. I would totally agree with you there. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there anything you want to plug? Nope. I'm going to talk to you. I mean, I guess like, <laughs> like uh, well, I could feel Jules saying in my ear, plug the podcast. Like, <laughs> So check out our podcast, Working People, like, because that's also kind of a living extension of this book, right? Because these are 10 interviews with workers during year one of COVID. But we've kept the show going all throughout this time. So in fact, the past three years of the show are in effect like additional chapters of this book, right? I mean, I spoke to shipyard workers on strike in Maine during COVID. I talked to teachers in Chicago, you know, who were battling with Mayor Lori Lightfoot over school reopenings a year ago, right? I talked to a massage therapist who could no longer work when COVID like got hit. Um, I talked to Sherry Renfro, a worker at Frito-Lay who went on strike two summers ago in the middle of COVID. So so definitely go check out the podcast. Um, subscribe on Patreon uh, if you can so we can keep doing this uh, important work. And so I can I can keep paying Jules more uh, to produce it <laughs> for me. Um Please check out The Real News Network. My day job is I'm the editor-in-chief here at The Real News Network in Baltimore. I think we do really uh, important work. It's not just the labor reporting that I do, my colleague Mel Buer and, and uh, the other correspondents who, who, who write for us and, and do interviews for us, but it's also the police accountability report um, that runs every Thursday uh, with Stephen Janice and Taya Graham. There's the Chris Hedges report, uh, which premieres on our channel every Friday at noon. Um, there's Rattling the Bars, the show that Eddie Conway, our, our colleague and comrade who passed away last month, founded, where we talk about the violence and victims of the prison industrial complex. Now that show is hosted by Mansa Musa, who was incarcerated for 48 years, longer than Eddie was actually incarcerated. And Mansa talks to uh, folks every week about how we can dismantle that the violence that is the prison industrial complex. Um, we, we produce a lot of great stuff for a pretty small team um, and we're viewer supported. So if uh, if you can, please check us out. Um, go to therealnews.com forward slash support and become a supporter of our work. It really, really makes a difference. Thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. Uh, also, since this is a co-sponsored podcast, I'd like to remind people that you can subscribe to Strange Matters and find... Uh, reviews, interviews, all kinds of things, uh, particularly on the history of money and inflation and the way that affects uh, working class people. Um, and uh, yeah, you can just subscribe to this channel. You guys can find my plugs later, so I'm not going to bother. All right. Um, have a great day. Thank you so much. <laughs>